his heart. So get all that in line. <clears throat> Mark chapter 9, if we were to give a short summary of the first oh, seven or eight verses, what would you say about it? Hopefully something. Well, they go on and out, and they see um, Elijah and um, Moses, and you know, yep. he wants to build the three altars there. Peter talks of my son. Yeah. And when we get going, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to recap on that. I think what confuses me there is how is Elijah John? How is Elijah? John. Isn't that supposed to be John? We're going to get into oh, that. Okay. <laughs> Hold that thought because that's the next several verses. Okay. okay. And with that, anybody have any more comments? Uh, we didn't go into verse number seven real deep there towards the end. You know, we can look up verses talking about the authority of Jesus and things of that nature. Uh, that was, should have been an awesome sight be one of the three to see those three but yet to hear the father out of heaven this is my beloved son listen to him you know we can go into what hebrews chapter one uh colossians chapter three and things of that nature to get more of the authority uh for him so we're to listen to jesus therefore this to me is a transitional one of those transitional verses for the jews because in essence, what did God the Father say in that one statement? If you think about it. Yeah. Not only listen to my son, but who not to listen to. Everybody else. Yeah, Moses and a lot. I mean, the lawgiver and then one of the major prophets. And just like the Sermon on the Mount, this is starting to move, you know, the Jews that would believe in Jesus to the day of Pentecost. I mean, because... What did they do to those two individuals that was with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. They, I mean, they studied them, should. Uh, they, I didn't say put them on a, on a pedestal, but yet that was, you know, some of the key individuals back in the Old Testament uh, that they looked to. And we'll see that in the next several verses. Any comments? If not, we're going to verse 8, 8 through 13. <clears throat> I want to pick on my right side, left side. So, Ellen, if you would start, we're going to go into verse 8 through 13, and we're just going to loop around on that side. And all at once we looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should rise from the dead. So they kept this word themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead men and they asked him saying why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first and he answered and told them Elias early come first and restore all things and how is it written of the son of man that he must suffer many things and be said at no but I say unto you that Elias is indeed coming they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him all right, we'll get to those verses, Trey, 11, 12, 13, 14, talk about Elijah. But before then, we got to get the folks down off that mountain uh, and couple them up with the, with the crowd that is starting to gather, uh, as we'll see in verse 14. So in verse 8, who would be the they part of that verse? I mean, it's not a trick question. Who was up there on the mountain? Peter, James, Peter, James John, with Jesus. Okay, they came down. And uh, counting something in verse 9 that Jesus has told them, but yet we've heard it before that he's told others, you know, don't tell anybody what happened, but yet they went and told them, you know, what Jesus did for them as far as healing. But in verse 9, what did Jesus tell the three? Well, they, they could tell people after a certain point, <laughs> but they yeah. had to keep it quiet until he raised from the dead. Okay, there you go. Okay. Out of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who would be 
According to scholars, the first gospel recorded out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, I can eliminate John. He wrote in the 90s, so he's gone. So he would have been the earliest out of the three to write. I'm kind of driving the point home. Okay, Scar says it's Mark. Okay, they claim that he wrote in that Matthew and Luke County went in his gospels and picked and choose and then expanded upon uh, their gospels to their crowd. Okay, if that's been the case, if Mark is the first gospel coming out, this is, from what I can tell, I went back and read the first nine chapters that Jesus told any of his disciples about his death or his resurrection. Okay, makes sense. So if Mark is the first writer, then he would have been the front runner of this. So this would have been the first time. So Jesus, hey, don't tell anybody until after he gets done. Somebody turn with me to, uh, see, I wrote it down. John chapter 16, I believe it is. I'm going to hook up a couple of verses here. And verse number 13. If somebody's got it, I won't pick on anybody if whoever gets there first. John thir or excuse me, John 16, 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. Okay. Bear with me. So what was one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit? To guide them. Okay, to guide them. Okay, because no doubt Jesus said a lot of things during that three and a half years that they, they were with him. And they probably could. Part of it they didn't comprehend anyway, so the Holy Spirit would have been with them. Come with me to 2 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1. Now, you get the event, Jesus told them not to say anything, Peter, James, and John, until after his death, after his resurrection. We got the Holy Spirit guiding them into all truth. In verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God, talking about Jesus, the Father, uh, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on that holy mount. So Jesus said, after. And here's Peter, who was a eyewitness to that event, writing about that event after uh, Jesus' obvious death and resurrection. Thought that was kind of interesting. Don't say anybody. You can imagine them coming down. Put yourself in their their shoes if you can. Sandals. They just saw this transfiguration. They're coming down with Jesus. The excitement they would have. Hey, I was an eyewitness of this. Nobody else has seen it. And then Jesus all of a sudden said, don't tell anybody. Secret. Oh, you tell that to my son, the secret's already gone. <laughs> but they had to keep it until after his resurrection. But yet, did they understand what he was telling them? Drop down to verse 10. So don't say anything. Until after my death, after obviously my resurrection. And what was their question? What were they discussing? Yeah. So even though he started to tell them, they still, I mean, had no clue. Okay. They had no clue on the day of ascension, did they not? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They were still looking. Hey, where's this heavenly kingdom? They still didn't have a clue. It wasn't until chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came and obviously day of Pentecost establishment of the church. So here they are coming down. Jesus told them, to start, you know, what's this raising that he's talking about? Raising from the dead means. You know? And in verse 8, they ask him saying, why is the scribe said that Elijah must come first? Hey, we're going to stop right there. Any questions, comments before we get? Because we'll spend the rest of the class, no doubt, on this, which is okay. Because in my research, I found these passages very interesting. 
And if you line it up, <clears throat> and I want y'all to <clears throat> see how many Elijahs we're going to actually be talking about. Okay. Um, we find in Luke's account, this is also recorded in Luke 9 and Matthew 17, and they piece together a little bit more. Coming down off the mountain, apparently they spent a day, because Luke records in chapter 9, verse 37, the next day that they came down. Uh, you know, the state of mind is, you know, they saw their witness to the transfiguration. They saw Moses, saw Elijah. They heard the voice from heaven. Uh, Jesus comes and tells them, don't say anything until after my death, after my resurrection. And that was kind of a reality check, I think. You know, they're up on cloud nine, one of the few to witness, and all of a sudden Jesus said them not to do this, and they kind of brought them down to reality. Then they started talking about the scribes and Elijah. We go back to Malachi, which we are, fourth chapter, last couple of verses. We find that an Elijah there is being talked about. Turn with me over to Malachi. We're going to spend some time with it. If I don't deviate from my notes, we'll be all right. Verse 5, you know, in verse 4 it says, uh, Malachi is telling them, you know, remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes, the ordinance which I command him from Hebron for all Israel. We stop right there. If, if we know about Malachi, what was one of the big things the people were doing back in his time? Can we remember? They were doing sacrifices, but what was they sacrificing? Remember, the old law says if you sacrifice, what were you supposed to sacrifice as far as the animal sacrifice? Unblemished, not spotless, the best, uh, first born, or not first, first year. Malachi's time was. We're going to get the worst that we got, the disease, the lame, you know, an animal, a lamb, a bull, whatever, that nobody would want, basically on their deathbed, and we're going to go and sacrifice. And they did, and they sacrificed that to God. God's reason was, hey, why don't you go sacrifice that to your governor and see what he would say? So they were off offbeat here, so they... Malachi is telling them, remember, in verse 5, Behold, I am coming to send you and you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will come and smite the land, or I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Given that, who would that Elijah be that Malachi is talking about? We're look, yeah, we're looking to the future. Okay. This is the last part of the Old Testament. This is the last thing that the Old Testament that God allowed to close it out. Okay. With the promise, with the hope that another Elijah is going to be out there in the future. And he's going to come before that great and terrible day, which, if I understand that phrase, would be the final judgment. So the Old Testament ends. How many years is it, is it going to take, or it takes, before Mark starts writing his account of the gospel? About 400 years. 400 years of science, and that's where you get the Maccabees and all this other stuff. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> Go back to Mark. You get this idea. Okay, here's Elijah. Out in the future, it's going to be John the Baptist. Mark chapter 1 begins with a quote from Isaiah talking about who? <clears throat> John the Baptist, or baptized, whichever way you want to call him. So there's, there's the end. Okay. We end the Old Testament talking about Elijah, looking at the future, 
way down the line in the future with John the Baptist. We open up with Mark. Uh, he quotes Isaiah. I believe that's going to be like the 40th chapter, verse 3, uh, saying, Behold, I'll send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way, the voice crying in the wilderness, make ready uh, the way of the Lord, make his path. What other things can we compare John the Baptizer with Elijah other than the message? Amy. Well, in Luke 1, uh -huh. verse 17, it says, He'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Very good. Um, we'll bring that on out. Conti the children. Continue. Okay. The spirit. So, Elijah in Old Testament, was he one of these that, like, okay, you're going to do, go on, or was he a, a very, I'm uh, trying to use the word. Uh, well, they both lived in the wilderness. Yeah. Elijah was more. Kind of running for his life. Yeah. It was even basically begging God to die. Yeah. He was probably, other than Elisha, who comes a little bit later, the main prophet at the time. Very dynamic, very forceful, I guess. Uh, who all did he go up against? Uh, Jezebel. Yeah. Uh, just all types of folks, and, and yet, uh, he got to the point in his life where he thought, what, he was the only one left? After the, if you want to call it the battle, the 450 bells at Mount Carmel, as Matt said, he was running for his life. And he got to the point where I'm the only one left. Yet, what did God reveal to him in a vision? You're not the only one left, Elijah. I got 7,000. Other folks that have not bowed their knee to Baal. So that was an encouragement. What else we can compare uh, John the Baptizer with Elijah? Their message, very forceful. I mean, we can look at John the Baptizer. He was really just like Jesus, mailing the Pharisees and their stuff. What about physical? Almost identical if you, if you read, you know, here's Elijah. A uh, hairy person, obviously, wearing skins, had a leather, leather belt around his waist. And the New Testament uh, describes John the Baptizer with skin, camel skins wearing them, wearing camel skins, a belt around his waist, as was pointed out, in the wilderness. Uh, folks had to come to him. He didn't go to them. And his message was very forceful. So there's some similarities between the two. I don't like to go into commentaries, but I found this one pretty good on the subject of Malachi uh, chapter 4, 5, and 6. I want to just read it verbatim. That way I don't get off and on a tangent and what have you. Uh, it said about Malachi 4, 5, and 6, before the terrible day of the Lord, Elijah would come to once more call the remnant. His purpose would be to reconcile of those presents at his coming with the covenant faith of their fathers. Elijah, the person, perhaps more than any other prophet of the pre-exile period, pleaded for the return of the pure worship of Jehovah as implemented by the law of Moses. Does that make sense? The second Elijah, what we've been talking about, John the baptizer, uh, would have the same purpose. Okay, remember when he first started preaching? First started visiting, making way for Jesus coming? A okay, very forceful uh, message similar to Elisha. Uh, unless this is done, there would be not even a remnant in that day, in the whole earth, which Jehovah has striven to redeem, uh, would stand under a curse. And that curse back in chapter Malachi 4, 6, I think the last word is curse. That is actually uh, means a ban. Okay, when in these Gentiles, talking about the Gentiles, have no law and were ignorant of the covenant. So the Gentiles went not under the old law, correct? Old law was just for who? Jews. Jews, children of Israel. So here we got the Gentiles out there who uh, 
We're not under the law. who were ignorant of it. Uh, without God, without hope. And we can go to Ephesians 2.12 for them. Okay, bear with me. So if the remnant was not fully called in preparation for the day of the Lord, the whole world would stand permanently aligned, banned forever from the presence of God. So it took both Elijah's, and we hadn't even got to what I want to propose to you, a third Elijah sitting out there as well. One little bit more. The Old Testament is a continuous with the new. In other words, you go in the old, and it flows after 400 years into the new. Uh, therefore, the Bible can be thought of as what? One, one book with 66 chapters in it. We can look at it that way. The coming of Christ did not constitute a, a break, but it constituted what as far as the New Testament or the Old Testament prophecy? He, okay, New Covenant, he fulfilled. Okay, Every prophecy that was about Jesus in the Old Testament was fulfilled through him. Uh, the method and purpose of Jesus is to continue and to fulfillment of that method and purpose revealed in the call of Abraham. So if we go back to Abraham, what did Jesus fulfill? Remember the three promises? Okay, yeah, the seed promise. Okay, or he got the land and nation though. So this would be the seed promise. I would propose to you that you know we have Elijah the person, and we'll talk about him a little bit more. Who's the second Elijah? John the Baptist. And I want to throw this out. And we'll open up the can of worms and we'll study it this week. I propose that Jesus would also be called an Elijah in this scenario. Come with me to Matthew's account. And here's where I base it off of Matthew 17. Now, this is something I've studied. I haven't studied it all the way through. So correct me if I'm wrong. Pray you do. But in verse 10, we begin. <clears throat> and his disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them about John the Baptist. If we go to verse 11, I'm not an English major. I botch it up, but they're telling me that Elijah is coming would be past, present, or future. Tense. Future tense is coming and will restore all things. And if the old prophet Elijah has already been, which is talked about in verse 12, and if John the baptizer has already been, because what happened to him? He was beheaded. Who with this Elijah is coming and will restore all things be? Who for thought? Okay. Food for thought. Think about it. Because did not Jesus restore all things before he left? When he left, he established the church in Acts chapter 2. Was not his message similar to that of both John the Baptizer and of the old prophet Elijah? Probably with more force behind it. Because you can go to Matthew 23 and 24, and I would hate to be in those Pharisees. That Jesus is talking about with all those woes uh, and everything. Any comments? Just think about Elijah as Jesus in comparison. Well, I don't, I don't think he's saying that Elijah is coming. I think he was just reiterating what they were saying. The scribes were saying that the Elijah must come first. Okay. He's saying, indeed, Elijah <coughs> is coming first. And he's following, but I say that he has already come. Okay, so you're relating John the Baptizer being the Elijah in verse 11 saying that he's already yeah, come. Okay. 11, 
in Oops. verse 13 and 14, Hold for on. all the prophets and the law prophesied in the John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is the light of who is to come. Okay. As I'm just on this out food thought. <laughs> I'm not binding on anybody. Don't walk out of here and say, Mark said. Well, I did say, but you know, not gonna Matthew. That's kind of what I was thinking is his answer there is kind of more in context to their their previous question and not so much talking about him, because then he immediately follows it up, like she said, with that he's already come. And plus, you know, I can't remember exactly which verse it is. But you run into the question later, who do men say that I am? And they say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. And he doesn't say anything there to insinuate that there's the slightest bit of truth mm -hmm. to that, which, I mean, in the context makes sense why some of them would say that, that he's Elijah. They might interpret him as Elijah coming back mm -hmm. to prepare the way for an earthly messiah to, to have an earthly kingdom. But I kind of agree with Trey that I think it's more in the context of the previous question. Okay. Because he speaks kind of similar to that when he's talking about marriage and divorcing in 19 when he's saying Moses said this, but I said this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll pull this out too. Nobody's gone into John yet. <laughs> All right. Maybe playing a little bit of that, but I don't know. I just, I'm throwing this out. John chapter 1, verse 19. I think that's where Matt was, was bringing up, uh, you know, and he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ, saying John the Baptist was saying, I'm not the Christ. And they say, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, nope, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? Nope, not one of the prophets. Uh, they continue, who are you and what may uh, give an answer to those who sent us? Uh, what do we say about yourself to those that sent us down here to talk to you? And none of these folks, then what is his answer? I am. I am the voice crying in the wilderness. Bear ye the way of the Lord. Of all folks, of all group of people that should have known about Jesus when he was born and all through his life would have been the religious Pharisees, those that should have known the law. And even at this early part of his ministry, when John baptized, told him, go say that I am the one preparing for the Lord, that should have woke him up more. I mean, they've already had a chance at his birth, at Jesus' birth. He already had a chance at the age of 12. What happened at the age of 12 with Jesus? No. Yeah. Left behind for three days, found him in the temple doing what? Oh, he was asking and answering questions, you know, and that should have been a real good clue of who Jesus would be or is. Yet they were so, so blinded, were they not? So blinded. Questions or comments? I think here, him yeah. saying that he's not Elijah. Reinforces. You know, in what we've been studying, because I mean, this is reference to John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And what we've been studying, I mean, he, when he talks about Elijah's coming, it's more of a descriptive. When he says, I'm not, mm -hmm. he's literally not. Elijah, but he is in the sense that he's, you know, it's kind of like we talked about that had so much in common with the wilderness right. and the, the rough appearance. I mean, he's Just, not literally him, but based on the context of the scriptures, it's he's the him that they were talking about when talking about Elijah coming. To Just want prepare. everybody to think things through. <laughs> well, let's talk about John the Baptist. I mean, before we go on. I only took half a class, which, what do we know about him? Cousin of Jesus. How many months old? Or about six, sorry. He was a miracle baby. He was mm -hmm. uh, out of due time, just like he was. He had a special purpose. And his purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus. 
And even when Mary walked in the room before he was born, he leaped mm -hmm. in Elizabeth's school. When he's talking about a miracle birth, that would be the parents being over childbearing years. Okay. Not as bad in the Old Testament, but in the New, that uh, they would take, you know, where they've taken miraculous birth. What about his parents? You know, we talked about, what is that, uh, Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth? What do we know about them, other than the fact they were older, old? Is a priest. Yeah, which one? High priest. Okay. Well, let me back up. <laughs> Both sides of family came from priestly families. Does that make sense? Okay, we know Zacharias, because where was he, or what was he doing when he heard about, hey, you're going to be a dad? Yeah, he was doing his priestly thing, and then all of a sudden he came out. And what happened to him for several months? Couldn't speak until his birth. So, and Elizabeth also came from a uh, a priestly family as well. What else do we know about him? They already talked about being a forerunner of Jesus, preparing the way. Yes, Mark. You say priestly family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me read Levi's. Okay. Zacharias Priestley, she was Levi's. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, he came from good stock. What else we know? Forerunner of Jesus, preparing the way. Talked about his mission, his, uh, you know, Isaiah 43, and then that was fulfilled in, you know, Matthew 3 3, what he was, you know, preaching, teaching, things of that nature. Do you get the? Didn't he have to take the Nazarite vow? You must be reading my notes. <laughs> she did not see this, by the way. I'm still typing even late this afternoon. I was gonna throw out. Did he take a Nazarite vow? Did he? I mean, it doesn't say. But can we put a few things together? So what was what would be a Nazarite vow? Did I say that right? There were several a few things that they could do or couldn't do. Yeah. You could never cut your hair. Yeah. Those are two main ones. Yeah, I think there was a third in there, but those are two main ones. What was Elizabeth told about John before he was born? Couldn't have wine, couldn't have strong drink. So there's indication that that was a Nazarite vow. What else do we know? We talked about him preaching in the wilderness, just like Elijah. Uh, do we know kind of where his base of operation would be at? If I had a map up here. Obviously, if he was baptizing, what would that call for? Water, and much water. Okay, so there's the Jordan River, and there's not too many places that there was much water that had a wilderness close by. <clears throat> and indications are he was counting down towards the Dead Sea area, down in that part with Jerusalem being up here. Okay, uh, much water. Some say that he was on the other side, like on the Jordan side today versus the Israeli side. Didn't they just declare that recently or something? Yeah. I, or, I remember reading where they officially declared this was where this was yeah. the side of the river. The big thing is much water, and there he was. You know, we don't know. If we were to know the Bible, God's word would hold us. Okay. Just like what mountain did they come off of in transfiguration? We don't know. You know, there's speculation. I've got several pages that, that speculate. Who cares? God wanted us to know he would have put it right there. So he didn't. Uh, oh, a big one. A couple of big ones. Hadn't been touched on yet. What else about John baptized? Amy? He was, they, the, his parents were told that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from the womb, and that's before. Yeah. <laughs> Major, what else? Who came to see him to be? Scribes of the Pharisees, they came to. Yeah. 
And, uh, yeah, I think he had pretty much the same attitude toward them that Jesus had. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus was a little bit more stern. But yeah, they had the same. Nobody said it yet. When he, when he was in the womb, are you saying? No. Something else. Who came to see John the baptizer? Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Big. Did Jesus have to? No. Well, no. in a way he did, but he did. he's without sin. Right. So fulfill prophecy. Because the reaction of John at that point was, I don't need to be you know, baptizing you. You need to be baptizing me. Because <laughs> he knew. And even the day after, he called Jesus what to his disciples? The Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world. And then the, uh, I would call it the gruesome death that he faced. John the baptizer was, uh, for Herod, uh, Herod liked him. Okay. Herod, Herod liked him. However, because of his family, and what was that relationship of his family that got John the baptizer? Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you how strong John is to a king go up and say, it is unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Phil was just in the next territory, just across from him. But how many folks lost a life or whatever? He just went and said, it is, it's not right. So he ends up in prison. <clears throat> but what, who's Herod's wife that comes into play? Herodias, okay. What was the relationship between Herodias and John? They didn't like it. She did not like it. For the same reason. She knew that she was in an adulterous situation. And because of that, you know, John speaking, he, you know, she didn't like it. So there was an opportunity. You remember the feast that Herod brings all his folks in, and wrote his daughter must have made a dance. Go ahead, Mark. I, I sat here thinking there's, there's some similarities between Herodias and uh, Jezebel. They were both <laughs> strong-willed women, and when they had the mm -hmm. opportunity, they would, they, you know, took killing did not. Did not uh, deter them. Yeah. Didn't make that relationship, but that's a good relationship between the two. Gene? Uh, uh, Gospel of John in 10, look here in 1041, made this, uh, made this point. Said, uh, <coughs> in, yeah, 41 says, John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man be true. Now that's mm -hmm. I'm gonna make that point. Uh, yeah, then for any signs or miracles, or whatever, but yet what he said was true. And of course, Herodias' daughter tells you something about dance, I guess. Yeah, let's put on a show. We could have stories or <clears throat> applications of that. Herod made a, a vow or. Say, so, hey, you know, I'll give you up to what? Half his kingdom? Well, we can have application of that today about making vows like that or, you know, our words are blind, things of that nature, but we need to kind of think through it before we say it because he wasn't anticipating her going back to mom. Mom said, hey, go ask. So there goes John, beheaded. Question is, what happened to his head? We don't know. Doesn't really matter, but we know what happened to his body. You know, his disciples came and properly buried it. So that's a few things about John the Baptizer. And John will have a play, even though he's dead and gone, throughout the rest of Jesus' life because they refer back. You know, uh, John sends some of his disciples to Jesus and say, Hey, you know, are you the one we need to be following? And of course, Jesus' response is, Look at what I'm doing. Look at the signs. And they go back to John. Any thoughts or comments? We've got a couple of minutes. Mark, yes. Did Jesus make the, the statement that there was one greater than John the Baptist? Yes. But when he is the least in heaven. Exactly. When the kingdom comes, he'll be the least. Because 
Remember, he was still in the old law before the church was established, Acts chapter 2. So even though he was that great, he would still be the least in the kingdom. But you think about that statement, a lot of great men mm -hmm. read about the Bible, what Jesus would know. So he must have been exceptional. You know, you know, we yep. don't have a whole lot written about John, just what we study. And what we, yep, what we do. I would just like to get to heaven to ask spirit to spirit. Hey, if you're the least, I'm right here beside you. All right. Okay. Uh, going on into ch or <clears throat> chapter 9 of Mark, uh, we kind of change gears. Verses 14 through 29. We're not going to get into this, but 14 through 29 is one event. Okay. Uh, kind of a lengthy event. Yet there's a lot of good lessons within it. Uh, we have uh, some disciples not able to deal with an unclean spirit. Okay, I lost my words. And yet the father came to Jesus and said, hey, listen, disciples can't do anything. Can you do something? So we'll do with that, you know, next week. Uh, You know, we're going to talk about belief, about faith, about prayer. Just a lot of you know, good good lessons throughout throughout it. Uh, yes, I am killing time. <laughs> it is the next day after Transfiguration, so they're still within that time frame. Uh, we have them coming down the mountain. We all know which mountain. Before them, as we will get to next week, is a large crowd. Just picture this. Jesus and the three coming down, there's a large crowd, and they see him. And their reaction is, they started running toward him. And I get in between those two, the father brings his, his son up and says, hey, unclean spirit, can you deal with him? And Jesus kind of, I get the idea, I've heard through it, and, uh, and healed him. So we'll deal with that next week. Thank you for your comments. We'll get your hymn books and turn to hymn number 767. That would be the invitation hymn, <clears throat> 767. And the hymn before Brother Trey gets up here would be number 36, hymn number 36. <clears throat> if I happen to stop, y'all keep going. I don't know if my voice... Amazing grace, we'll sing a little bit. Verse 5. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Corinthians chapter 12. In just a few moments, I'm going to read a few verses from this chapter. I switched on my way up here. I was I told my daughter-in-law just before services, I said, I'm going to use what you talked about. Well, she had Nathan talk about it during the funeral, but I'm uh, changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. I don't know if she was going to tune in and watch tonight. She'll have to wait on that. But we have a note here, and it's tying into our invitation. Debbie wrote it today, and she was trying to read to me what she wrote. She couldn't get through it. But again, it ties into this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, thank you all for your kind words, your thoughts, your offers of help, your flowers, your cards, and most importantly, your prayers. It was very comforting knowing our church family in Newburgh cares so much about us. I almost got through it. <coughs> Continued prayers will be appreciated for Nathan and Bella as there will be more difficult days ahead. With Christian love, Chuck and Debbie. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. I know there have been many, I know there are many families here that have received the love from the members here when they have gone through heartache. But you know, I, I've never been on the receiving end quite like this week. You know, usually if you send flowers, it'll go to a funeral home or something. But there was no funeral home, and so I was just sitting there, and a lot of us were in Nathan and Bella's small apartment. We were just kind of sitting around and comforting each other every day. And they would bring some flowers into the house. And when the flowers came in, and it, you know, they're just carrying them, and Nathan just, you know, he's glancing who, you know, who this is from. And, and he walked past me and just said, oh, River Ridge. Just cut. It's great being part of family. It's great being part of family. And we are. And we appreciate that. And this passage is talking about that we're all baptized into one body. 
I don't want this to be a downer. I want this to be an encouragement to every one of us here. Number one, if you're not a Christian, you're missing out on one of the greatest blessings God has ever given us. Not only to become a Christian and have a hope of heaven, but you become a part of family. That's a wonderful thing that none of us ever needs to take for granted here. Every one of us has struggles. You know, part of the, my daughter-in-law's words were, let's try and be understanding. You never know what people are going through. You know, the old Indian saying, you know, walk a, I don't know, walk so many miles in my moccasins before you judge me. That's a really poor rendition of whatever that saying is. But again, it's this whole idea of, of let's be understanding. And the thing I get most of all is, you know, we hear that old saying, don't sweat the small stuff. You know, there's, there's a lot of heartache in here, but there's heartache even here right tonight with you all because we all face it every day. The devil is trying to pull us down, and we just need to remember we're here for one another. We have invitations all the time, but it never has to be just during Wednesday and Sundays. You pick up a phone, you call a brother or sister and say, pray for me. I'll get a text once in a while. I'll get a brother who will text me and say, just pray for me. I'll write him back. You got it. That's what you do. We're there for one another. And so I want you to think about your relationship with the Lord tonight. Life is short. We, we know that. It's uncertain. But we have today. That we have for certain. If you're not a Christian, you need to do something about it. All things are ready. If you're a child of God that's gone wayward, you need to come back. But even if you just need the prayers of your brothers and sisters, you have no idea how much that helps. It's a cliche. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your prayers. But I witnessed things this past week, and I'm sitting there. God is helping. God is, is helping, and you can see it. And it was a wonderful blessing. We love you all for that. We need to love each other. We need to love God more. We need to love each other more. Let's just make sure we're right with the Lord. And if you're subject to the invitation, will you please let it be known as we stand together and sing the song.
real quick. The new quarter for teachers starts October 4th. So we got a Sunday, I believe, and a Wednesday when the new quarter starts. So four quarter teachers, give them three quarter teachers, kind of where they're at because they're saying most of the classes are going to different classes. Just by the way the weather was and things that matter. And as far as that goes, so you'll need to coordinate a little bit more than just assuming the quarters are not what they need to be or not. <laughs> Any other announcements? I did not get to supposed to suggest it. Any, any more announcements or suggestions? Any other questions? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you at this time thanking you for this day that we've had and this time that we've had together this night to meet with fellow Christians and to open your word and to learn from it once more. We pray that we are always striving to better ourselves as Christians and that we are letting our light shine in this world. We pray that we are always remember that we're here to support one another and that we need to do what we can to lift each other's burdens. Pray that you would be with us the rest of this week and keep us safe as we travel home this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to have to find out that